I don't see anything there. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're located in the United States or abroad. Uh, this is a great pleasure to be back with you again for what represents probably about our 14th or 15th webinar. And I welcome all of you that are here. I know we have a big crowd and there are going to be a lot of questions that are going to be coming. But I'm really especially excited to do this particular webinar because it deals with the most important factor that determines outcome with IVF. And that's the selection of the ideal protocol for ovarian stimulation. Um, nothing is more important than doing so because 80% of success or failure with IVF is going to depend upon the competency of the embryo that you transfer. And as you'll hear as I go through this in the presentation, that all stems from the egg, primarily. Not exclusively, the sperm as well, but primarily from the egg and the laboratory to some extent, but much more from the egg that you deliver to the laboratory to fertilize for you. And the quality of the egg in turn is very, very much influenced by the hormonal environment in the ovary, which in turn is affected by stimulation. So nothing is more important, in my opinion, than um, choosing the right protocol for stimulation. Before I go to the actual presentation, just a little bit, a bit of uh, basic uh, business to cover. Um, it's important for everyone to know that this is going to be an initial presentation of about 40 to 50 minutes by me, followed by a question and answer session. And I urge you as we go through this, if you get questions, to start submitting your questions in the chat box that you'll find next to the video window at any time during this presentation so that we can get a sizable number of questions to answer down the line. Any additional questions that you don't get answered, please feel free to submit to the forums, haveababy.com, the SIRM Las Vegas Discussion Board. Post your questions there and I'll be very happy to answer them. Or, alternatively, many of you are probably familiar with my blog, which is called ivfauthority.com. It's a very busy blog and I go there several times a day to address questions that come from interested parties and those that have issues that they want to get resolved. So you can post your questions on the open, uh, openly on my blog as well on the question and answer session, section. And I'll be happy to address them if you do that as well. Then finally, I'd like to say that anybody who attends this uh, webinar and is interested in talking to me about your particular problem, where we'll spend an hour via a Skype consultation. And I emphasize all my consultations are done by, via Skype for people out of city and out of town and out of state and out of country. So we have a very personalized interaction and it's about an hour long. So I urge you to call 1-800-780-7437 to set, this con set up this consultation with Tina and she'll fit you in and we'll have a chance to discuss your case in detail. Um, for those of you that are out of country and the 800 number doesn't work, there is a direct number which is, please write this down because it's not on the slide, it is 702-699-7437. Again, 702-699-7437 to call Tina in order to set up a Skype consultation with me. Obviously, you can also visit our website anytime you choose, haveababy.com. So let's start talking about the topic at hand, which is um, the selection of the protocol for ovarian stimulation. And as I mentioned, the most important consideration is the quality of the embryo that you replace in the uterus which in turn depends upon the egg rather than the sperm primarily and upon, to some extent, uh, the laboratory. But most importantly, the embryo quality is going to be the rate limiting factor in human reproduction. And here it is, the chromosomal integrity of the embryo. The human genome is 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs side by side. The embryo is no different in order to be competent. And that term means able to propagate a live birth if transferred 
into a healthy receptive uterus, the embryo has to have a normal chromosomal configuration of 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. If there's even one chromosome more, or one chromosome less, or many more, or many less, then we have a condition known as aneuploidy. An aneuploid embryo is one which has more or less than 46 chromosomes, and such an embryo is incompetent, and that incompetency stems primarily, almost in the vast majority of cases, from the egg and not from the sperm. Here's a little slide that shows you the various stages of development. This is an egg that has just been fertilized. You can see the two nuclei, the one of the sperm and the one of the egg. This is called a pronucleate embryo because it has basically been fertilized, but it hasn't divided. The better name for it is a zygote, which means an embryo that has been fertilized, but not hasn't started dividing. And then approximately two days into the process, the embryo divides up into two, em two cells. And by day three, there will be roughly eight cells. Uh, there'll be roughly somewhere around five to nine cells. An embryo that has less than five cells three days after fertilization is usually an aneuploid embryo, but not always so. And an embryo that has more than eight cells, rather than dividing too slow, as in the former case, is dividing too fast. And such an embryo is similarly incompetent and aneuploid in many cases. The final stage is that by two days later, day five or day six after fertilization, the embryo reaches the stage we call the blastocyst stage. At this stage, it has a central blister full of fluid known as the blastocele, and around it, it has a layer of cells we call the trophectoderm, which is the cells we often biopsy when we do uh, chromosomal analysis of the embryo or karyotyping. This area in the center of the blastocyst, toward peripherally, but the large blob in the center here, is known as the inner cell mass. This is the, 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 the area that forms into the baby. The trophectoderm forms the membranes and the placenta, and the area here, the inner cell mass, forms the baby. And around it, there is a shell or a uh, gelatinous uh, envelopment known as the zona pellucida, the same envelopment that surrounds the egg and the earlier embryos. So then, in summary again, an embryo that divides too slowly and does not reach the five-cell stage at least by day three, or divides too fast and is beyond the nine-cell stage by day three, is more likely than not aneuploid. Embryos that make it to the blastocyst are more likely to be chromosomally normal because many abnormal ones will have fallen out along the way and not have reached the blastocyst stage. Embryos that don't reach the blastocyst stage are almost always aneuploid, abnormal, and you don't want them anyway. So who are we kidding? Why would we even consider transferring embryos that haven't at least proven that they can reach that, that stage of the blastocyst where they have a better chance of being normal? So again, this is very important. Embryos that don't make blastocysts are, not, they are usually incompetent and aneuploid and not worthy of using. Embryos that reach the blastocyst are not always normal, but are far more likely to be normal than an embryo that looks good earlier on because the abnormal ones often don't reach that stage of development. All right. So a competent embryo then, again, is one that has 46 chromosomes, is euploid, not aneuploid, as I've spoken about, and can propagate a, capable of propagating a healthy baby if transferred into a normal and receptive uterus. Embryo, uh, the next thing is, it, again, as I said earlier, to reiterate, it is the egg rather than the sperm that will be the major determinant of embryo competency and ploidy. This is an immature egg. Unlike uh, the mature egg, the immature egg is one 
where the chromosomes inside of the egg have not divided straight down the middle in order to shed those half of the chromosomes. Uh, they have their full component of chromosomes. They haven't been through what we call reproductive division. Now here I want to pause a while and explain something to you that's very important. Approximately 36 hours before ovulation or extraction of the egg, most eggs have got 46 chromosomes like all other cells of the body. It's in the ensuing 36 hours that the egg enters into a reproductive division known as meiosis where the objective is for the chromosomes to divide straight down the middle and half of the chromosomes to be ejected out of the egg and come to lie as a little envelopment under the surface of the shell in this vitellin space. You can see it here. This is the envelopment in a mature egg where you see the polar body, we call it a polar body, which contains and should hopefully contain half of the chromosomes that were in the egg when it was immature here and now has been wrapped up in a little membrane and evicted out of the egg to come to lie under the shell as the so-called polar body. What's left in the egg, therefore, should ideally be 23 chromosomes. A mature egg is one that has entered into this reproductive division, but it doesn't tell you that there's exactly 23 chromosomes left in the egg and 23 expelled. In fact, all it says is that the egg has gone into meiosis and the polar body has been uh, kicked out of the egg. In humans, many of, this, of these divisions of meiosis are irregular, so that there are either less or more chromosomes than 23 left inside the egg substance and less or more in the polar body. The two are mirror images of one another. If an embryo, if an egg does not have exactly 23 chromosomes, it is aneuploid. And an aneuploid egg will not make a competent euploid embryo. The egg has to be 23 chromosomes. Looking at a mature egg under a microscope does not tell you that that egg is competent or euploid and will be able to make a euploid competent embryo. One thing is for sure, such an immature egg as this one has all 46 chromosomes still wrapped up in it. Now, as I mentioned, it's in the 36 hours that precedes uh, ovulation or extraction when the egg goes through this reproductive division or meiosis. And it can only go through this reproductive division or in an orderly fashion if two criteria are met. One, it has the genetic potential to do so. So eggs enter into a cycle, some of which have no potential to do so under any circumstances and are always going to pr propagate aneuploid eggs after, for, after uh, the meiosis has set in. Then the other one, other than the genetic makeup, is the environment in which the egg develops. If the egg develops in an abnormal environment, then its systems are corrupted. And when it's forced to go into meiosis, it is more likely to produce an aneuploid egg, one that does not have irregular chromosomes. Again, those destined to be abnormal genetically will be abnormal no matter what you do. But those that have the potential going in to be normal can only fulfill that, uh, uh, that objective if they've developed normally in advance. What sends them into meiosis? In nature, in the natural state, it's the LH surge that you can measure in the urine with a dipstick around the middle of the month. And in IVF, it's the HCG trigger that we give that mimics what LH does and sends the egg into meiosis. This is the critical decisive factor. And because the environment in the ovary you'll see later on during stimulation can impact uh, whether the egg develops normally before it goes into meiosis 36 to 38 hours before it's extracted or ovulated, it is critical that we try to preserve an optimal environment in the ovary when we stimulate women for IVF. Otherwise, we'll get a higher than normal percentage of aneuploid eggs and therefore aneuploid embryos that are incompetent.
No embryology laboratory can produce competent or quality embryos from eggs that are abnormal or aneuploid. It is impossible. And yet when we get bad embryos, very often you find doctors telling the laboratory and saying, you know, the laboratory may not have done its job. Or you get patients like yourselves offering, often saying an abnormal embryo probably means the lab wasn't good. Well, I got news for you. In most cases, the embryologists are far more disciplined than are physicians who function not purely on science but on an art-science blend. They stick to the rules. Even an average laboratory will be able to produce competent embryos as well as, a, as an excellent laboratory. They may not be able to do certain manipulations of eggs and embryos, biopsies and, and assisted hatching and ICSI as well as others, but they are capable of nurturing and being responsible for the good quality embryos so that when we have poor quality embryos, the most likely explanation is not a poor laboratory. It's usually poor stimulation protocols. So then... What are the factors that will govern embryo aneuploidy? First, it's the woman's age, because that affects the chromosomal integrity of the egg, which in turn will determine whether the embryo will be chromosomally normal or not. In women in the early 30s, one in two eggs is going to be able to produce a perfectly euploid competent eggs that are, have exactly 23 chromosomes in them. When a woman reaches the age of 40, maybe one in six is normal. And by the way, when she reaches 45, only one in 20 or 25 are normal, which points to the fact that with advancing age, through wear and tear of eggs in a woman that have been in her ovaries ever since she was in her mother's uterus, there's an ever-increasing incidence of aneuploidy in the egg. And that is why, as women get older, there's a higher incidence of embryo aneuploidy. Therefore, it's harder to get pregnant, being that in nature, rejects are usually uh, expelled or don't, aren't allowed to even attach to the uterine wall. And if it does attach, it'll usually not stay long. It'll either end up as a chemical pregnancy, where the woman loses it before she knows she's pregnant, or it'll miscarry. And in very extreme cases, it'll result in a birth defect like Down syndrome or Edward syndrome. These are all due to aneuploidies originating in meiosis in the egg. And it's not something that just crops up de novo. So... The woman's age is important, and that's why it's harder to get women pregnant when we do IVF the older the woman gets, and it's harder to keep her pregnant to avoid miscarriage, because miscarriages most commonly occur as a result of embryo aneuploidy as well. After the woman's age, and we can't influence age, there is the protocol used for ovarian stimulation, as I pointed out. The objective of that protocol, as you'll learn in a moment, is to protect the egg from becoming disrupted during its developmental stage before it enters meiosis. Because that will set the scene for whether that egg will end up being euploid and able to propagate a competent embryo later on. The third factor is, of course, the embryo laboratory. And I put it last because it's often unfairly blamed for poor quality embryos when most of the problem relates to the quality of the patient, the age of the woman, and then the protocol selected. You cannot use a, a recipe approach to stimulation in ovarian, for ovarian stimulation. You've got to individualize it and strategize it based upon the woman's individual profile. That is the most critical decision that any IVF physician can make during the IVF process. So then, how do we determine the protocol? Well, firstly, of course, the woman's age will determine what basic sort of protocol we're going to tend to be more aggressive. But the two most important factors that help us individualize the protocol besides the woman's age is her ovarian reserve which is defined as the number of eggs left in her ovaries the number that are available and this keeps declining month by month as especially when the woman gets older when the 
total number of eggs left in the ovaries declines below a certain threshold, which can vary from patient to patient, or from woman to woman, the brain starts to crack the whip louder in an effort to make the ovaries produce more eggs, but of course they can't. They can't make additional eggs. You're born with all the eggs you're ever going to have, and when you've used them up, you go through menopause. So the brain becomes frantic. The pituitary, through being stimulated by the hypothalamus, starts to release more and more FSH. That's the whip cracking sound. And so when we see the woman's basal FSH in the first few days of her cycle going above 9 million international units per milliliter, we know that she's starting to get close to or has entered what we call the climacteric, which is a time when ovarian reserve begins to decline and she's got less eggs and therefore she's harder to stimulate and we've got to be more aggressive. But with that goes something else you'll see in a few moments. As the woman's ovarian reserve declines, not only does the FSH go up, but the LH's biological activity also goes up. And there's an area in the ovary I'll demonstrate to you in a moment that surrounds the follicles, known as the stroma or the theca, its connective tissue, that produces the hormone testosterone and androstenedione and DHEA, mainly testosterone now ever. And it's this area that overgrows and thickens in women as they get older, because when they get older, their LH biological activity also increases. And when their ovarian reserve declines and there's a chronically higher amount of LH being released along with FSH. And you learn in a few moments that too much testosterone, you must have some, but too much testosterone can have a deleterious effect on egg development and therefore increases the risk of egg competency and increases the chance of embryo aneuploidy. Now, we used to all hang on to this FSH measurement to give us an idea of how much we must stimulate the woman to get whatever egg she's able to produce to develop in the follicle. And that was all we had until quite recently. But with the advent of a new measure which measures AMH, anti-malarian hormone, I believe we have a much more sensitive measure. And you don't have to measure AMH in the first few days of the cycle. You can measure it any time in the cycle. And AMH goes down as ovarian reserve declines. In American units, if the AMH drops below 2 nanograms per milliliter, it's abnormal. When it drops below 1.5, it's definitively abnormal. When it drops below 1, it's bad. It's very abnormal. And when it drops below 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, you're in deep trouble. So ovarian reserve declines with age, uh, sorry, with proximity to the menopause, but it's primarily age that will determine the quality of the eggs. But ovarian reserve declining can be measured by the FSH of the AMH primarily. Inhibin B is hardly used anymore. And then the third thing we use to determine the best protocol that we need to stimulate the woman with is how she responded in previous protocols to previous stimulations. It gives us an idea of how many eggs she's got and helps fashion and design, help you design the protocol that will suit her best. So this is very important to understand. Try to view the stimulation that we use in any given woman as the amount of force we have to use to push a big rock to roll down a hill. The heavier the rock, the, high, the poorer the ovarian reserve, that is, the harder we have to push with fertility drugs. So the ovarian reserve is a moving target and it can decline pretty rapidly once it starts going down. So let's talk then about what we've spoken about because if you understand what I'm about to tell you, all the rest becomes self-evident. The stroma, as I told you, is the connective tissue that surrounds the follicle. What happens in the stroma is it produces male hormone, primarily testosterone. Now this is released in response to LH. And you've got to have testosterone because it's the building block which subjected, which, which when reaching the follicle, the inner cells of the follicle, and here you can see a follicle, this is the stroma or the connective tissue or the theca, this then is the follicle developing, 
and this is the these are the cells that line the follicles known as granulosa cells the testosterone is delivered from the stroma to the granulosa cells in a bucket brigade fashion where it's converted to estradiol through the action of FSH through enzymatic activity fancy enzymes known as aromatase and desmolase enzymes convert the testosterone to estradiol in these cells and as that happens the cells multiply the follicle stretches they pump the estradiol into the blood where we can measure it and the follicle expands and gets larger and we measure that by ultrasound and in the meanwhile the egg is developing in that follicle and a lot of this action of FSH is mediated through the developing egg, which, like the conductor in an orchestra, is sending messages to the cells and to the follicle to grow and develop accordingly. So it's very important to understand this mechanism because if a little bit of LH reaches the, 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 the uh, granulosa cells of the follicle, we get great estrogen production. But if there's excessive production of testosterone in the stroma, it enters into the fluid of the follicle, compromises egg development, increases the risk that when that egg goes through meiosis, it's going to be abnormal and, and incompetent and have an irregular quota of chromosomes and end up with a poor quality embryo. Now, as I said, some eggs are destined to be abnormal just genetically, and that's influenced also by age. And you can do nothing about that. All you can do is protect those eggs that had the potential to be normal. By avoiding excessive testosterone production, it means that you must have some testosterone, but not too much. If you've got too much, you compromise the quality of the egg. And therefore the embryo and therefore the outcome of IVF. So that's the important message. Too much testosterone compromises egg and embryo development. So then who's vulnerable to excessive production of testosterone? Firstly, older women, because the higher biological activity of the LH they produce makes the stroma and theca thicker, so there's a big, bigger target for LH to act on. Second, women who've got tumors or lesions or inside the ovaries or little ovarian endometriomas which irritate and activate the stroma and cause increased testosterone production in the ovary. And thirdly, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And of course, any woman with diminished ovarian reserve will have a thicker stroma and th theca as well. And these are the candidates that are most vulnerable to increased testosterone compromising egg, qu egg quality. So then, what happens as a result of too much testosterone? Poor follicle development, poor egg quality with increased aneuploidy, and interestingly, also poorer response of the endometrium to estrogen, because high testosterone output to the ovary can leach across to the uterus, interfering with the ability of the endometrium to respond to estrogen. And we often see this in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, who as part of their condition have a very thickened stroma or theca and have a high output of testosterone and have high LH. They are very often unable to produce good linings. And it can therefore produce poor implantation rate because the lining is too thin and as a result poor IVF outcome. So what leads to increased exposure to, LA, to, 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 to testosterone or androgens? Firstly, it's a high LH. I've told you the age of the woman, ovarian resistance, which means diminished ovarian reserve, and polycystic ovarian syndrome are the ones that are more likely to be associated with increased biological LH activity. The second is protocols that you use for stimulation. There is a protocol known as a flare protocol, where the woman is given an agonist, and you'll see this later, at the very start of stimulation. Lupron and Bucerolin are examples of this. Nafarella and Cinerella are other examples. They are nasal agonists. What the agonist does and the way it works is it causes expunges all of the LH out of the pituitary in one blast in a couple of hours. If this is done as with a flare protocol, 
As the cycle of stimulation begins, then the LH hits the ovary at the most vulnerable stage of the egg as it's trying to get out of the starting gates. And as a consequence, you get too much ovarian testosterone and egg quality is compromised. This usually is not a problem if a woman has normal ovarian reserve and is young. But if you use it in older women, women with diminished ovarian reserve where they have an exaggerated production of testosterone, now you're in trouble. So I never use flare protocols ever on any of my patients, but I see the rationale for using it in some patients. As long as they are young in their early to mid-30s and have normal ovarian reserve with an AMH of over 2, I think you can use it in those. And I don't think you should ever use it in older women because the, the LH they produce has increased biological activity. So that is why, in my opinion, the use of flare protocols in older women and women with diminished ovarian reserve is contraindicated. Clomiphene and letrozole, which is also known as Femara, also increase LH production throughout stimulation. That is why clomiphene, besides being an anti-estrogen, doesn't work well in older women. I never use clomiphene in women over 40 because the baby rate is about 1 in 100. It's really not worth using. In young women who don't have a decreased ovarian reserve, and um, in such women, clomiphene can work and is still good, but its results are always poorer always poorer. Whether you use clomiphene alone or with IUI than if you were to use injectable for, uh, fertility drugs. In the use of menotropins such as Menopure is also okay in younger women who don't have diminished ovarian reserve, but menotropins contain increased activity of LH-like activity, mainly HCG, which is like LH. So, I don't use high dosage of, of, uh, uh, of Menopure in any of my patients. And I especially don't use high dosages of Menopure or Menotropins in women that are older and women with diminished ovarian reserve. In these women, I try to keep the level very low, under 75 units a day. And all the rest of the, of the gonadotropins I give are FSH-rich, FSH products that are uh, recombinant DNA FSH like Folistum, Gonlef, or, or uh, Purigon. Other women that have increased exposure to androgens, as I pointed out, are those with tumors or cysts or endometriomas in the ovary, which is a reason why I personally, in my opinion, think it's wise to always remove endometriomas before stimulation begins, especially if they're larger, because the ovary is so affected. Not both ovaries, but the ovary that contains the endometrioma is likely to have too much exposure of the eggs to testosterone, ending up in poor quality eggs and embryos on that ovary. Then the other one is to directly give androgens, testosterone or DHEA, which is converted to testosterone. Personally, I see no merit in this practice. But if you're giving a woman pure FSH, and you're not giving her anything that has any LH activity in it, and you need some testosterone, remember, so you need some LH activity, and that woman has been suppressed in advance with an agonist or an antagonist, the agonist like Lupron, or an antagonist like Ganorelix, and we'll get to that later, or Cetratide or Orgolutron, then they may not be producing any testosterone in their ovaries. Then, if you want to add a little bit of testosterone, you can do so. My preference, however, is to use a small amount of Menopure, which contains HCG, and will cause that stroma to produce enough testosterone. So I don't use testosterone in any of my patients who are being stimulated. I know there are some papers and publications that suggest that a little bit of testosterone might help. Yes, if you're only using pure recombinant FSH in a woman who's had a her production of LH blocked with the agonist or antagonist, then a small amount of testosterone during stimulation probably does no harm, but it's got to be very low dosages. And I personally think it's quite hazardous and dangerous, so I don't use it. I never use DHEA to patients to improve the production of 
uh, to, to improve ovarian reserve because I believe it gets converted to testosterone in the ovary. And the very woman where you want to improve egg quality and diminish ovarian reserve is a woman who's already producing uh, a lot of testosterone in her ovaries, has diminished ovarian reserve. So I don't ever advocate the use of DHEA. Some do. I don't think it does a lot of harm if given to younger women who have normal ovarian reserve. But then again, what's the point in doing that when the reason for using it is to improve ovarian reserve? And if she's already got normal ovarian reserve, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So how do we limit exposure? We limit it by using purified FSH and not menopure in the main, especially for older women and women with diminished ovarian reserve. We limit exposure by making sure any tumors or endometriomas or cysts in the ovaries are removed before the stimulation begins. And we, 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 we limit exposure by using protocols that suppress LH before the stimulation begins and throughout the stimulation and then replaces it a small amount of LH activity or HCG activity in the form of menopure to give you enough testosterone to be able to produce, uh, to, to have proper granulosa cell growth and follicle and egg development. I always avoid flare protocols, especially, I would say, don't use it in older women and women with diminished ovarian reserve, and I don't use Clomid or Femara ever in IVF. There are people that disagree. Some people use it in many IVF patients. My problem with that is that those people that think they should have mini IVF are often the older women with diminished reserve, the exact ones who would not benefit and are ill-advised to use any drug that's going to overexpose them through LH-induced testosterone. So I don't use Clomid or Femara in my IVF patients. So what drugs are available for stimulation? Well, there's firstly the Clomid Femara. They are um, um, aromatase inhibitors. Their Clomid is not as good as Femara because it's an anti-estrogen, which Femara is not. They both cause the release of FSH and LH from the ovary. So if you're using these drugs, in my opinion, they are best used in women undergoing ovarian stimulation with things like um, PCOS or other conditions. Agonists, Lupron, Superfact, and Bucerulin. These are excellent drugs if used appropriately, in my opinion. And that, in my opinion, is that you give it, you start it before the stimulation begins. There's an advantage to doing that. You start on cycle day 21, or if the woman's on a birth control pill, you overlap the pill with the agonist Lupron or Superfact, and that expunges all the FSH out of the pituitary. And in the process, what happens is it makes the antral follicles develop properly. And by the time the period starts five or six days later, now all the LH that was expunged is gone. And by continuing daily to give the Lupron, it's like squeezing a sponge and keeping your fist clenched. It doesn't fill up again. And so the pituitary is exhausted of LH and the developing follicles are not harmed. Many people will tell you that if you use a birth control pill, which I think is an excellent way, the preferred way to stimulate all patients doing IVF because it suppresses LH and FSH, people will tell you that it will suppress their response to stimulation. Well, it only suppresses response in my 33 years of experience in doing IVF in cases where you use the pill all the way through to the day that you start the stimulation and you don't overlap it with the agonist Lupron or Superfact or Brucerolin. In such cases, you will suppress FSH, you'll suppress LH all the way up to stimulation and you require a rise in FSH just for a few days before the period starts in order to get properly uh, responsive antral follicles. If you don't, then the antral follicles will not respond to stimulation and it will take longer, five or six days, on the FSH drugs that you use to make up for what should have happened before the stimulation. So when you hear people tell you that they are that the birth control pill suppressed their response, always ask the question, did you use the pill all the way up to the stimulation? 
Or did you use the pill and overlap it with the agonist? If you overlap it with the agonist, the pill will not suppress response. And it's an excellent uh, a tool for making sure that some LH is still available in the stimulation, that no LH is there when the stimulation begins because you've started it before the cycle began and expunged all the LH out of the pituitary. And it also will give you follicles then, that uh, antral follicles that are ready to respond because the Lupron the super fact, the, the bucerolin, will have caused the FSH to rise before the cycle of stimulation began. So agonists work by expunging all of the FSH and LH out of the pituitary, while antagonists like cetratide, cetratide, ganrelix, and orgolutron work by blocking the release of LH and FSH from the pituitary. And that is good if you use it after the stimulation begins. There are many, including myself, who believe that Lupron makes it harder for the follicle to respond to stimulation. So women who've got diminished ovarian reserve, my preference is to use an agonist-antagonist conversion protocol. I start with Lupron, but when the period begins, I switch over to the antagonist, which blocks the release of LH from the pituitary. But uh, it does not impede response to stimulation. Well, let me clarify here. Women who, be, who are an antagonist from the very first day of, their, of stimulation will note that the estradiol levels are lower in their blood. That doesn't mean that there's not estradiol around. It just means that the methods we use for measuring estradiol in women that have received prolonged antagonists is not perfect and we get lower readings so what we then look for when we use the so-called agonist antagonist conversion protocol is we look for the trend in the rise of the estradiol rather than its absolute level and the growth of the follicles but antagonists are good the common way antagonists are used and you'll see this in a moment in everyday ivf is to start on the sixth or seventh day of the cycle my problem with that is that you're doing nothing in the preceding six days before you start the antagonist to block LH. And when you use the antagonist protocol starting on sixth or seventh day of the cycle in women with diminished ovarian reserve and older women, you will get a poor response. I don't believe that this is the ideal way to use antagonists. In my practice, I administer the antagonist from the very first day of stimulation. But I never use a birth control pill in the cycles that lead into the stimulation unless it's overlapped with the Lupron. Even if you use a birth control pill and then go on to an antagonist cycle, you're going to get a poorer response, in my opinion, because you've suppressed antral follicle uh, maturation and development in the process by not allowing the FSH to rise adequately before the cycle begins. HCG stimulation. There are many forms. We use exclusively Pregnile, Profasi, or Novarel, and we give 10,000 units. Remember what I said earlier, it's the LH and HCG, it's HCG and IVF and the LH in natural cycles that sends the egg into meiosis. And if you don't have an adequate amount of HCG present, the egg won't go properly into meiosis and you'll get a higher number of eggs that don't develop properly and are more likely to be abnormal. I never use 5,000 units of HCG, Pregnal, Profasi or Novarel, and I don't administer 250 micrograms of Ovidrel because that is equivalent to 5,000 units of Pregnal, Profasi or Novarel. Ovidrel is a recombinant form of HCG and when you use it, you must double the dose, in my opinion, to 500 micrograms rather than 250 to be able to send the eggs into meiosis properly. And this becomes even more essential in the very cases where people are often frightened of giving a full dose because of a fear of hyperstimulation, namely women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. They've got so many follicles that if you give too little HCG, you're not going to get good eggs. You're going to get many more immature eggs, many more eggs that are aneuploid and a much poorer success rate in my opinion. And then comes estrogen for ovarian stimulation. The only place of estrogen 
is to precede the stimulation in very, very poor responders because the estrogen you then give will prime the follicle granulosa cells to respond better to FSH and the, you'll get a better response. Estradiol valerate is what I use, but skin patches are fine. Oral estrogen, in my opinion, is not good because anything you take by mouth gets absorbed through the intestine and then goes via the liver where it gets altered. So you don't get the levels in the systemic circulation that you get when you give injections or use skin patches. So when we administer estrogen to prime, and I'll show you examples in a few moments, very poor responders with very diminished ovarian reserve so as to get a better response and make them respond better to FSH stimulation, I use injectable estradiol valerate. It's absorbed more evenly. It's given under the skin intramuscular, just superficially, and it's absorbed slowly, so you only need to give the shots twice a week. So let's look at some of these protocols very quickly. This is the long, my, my staple protocol of stimulation that I use in most of my patients who have normal ovarian reserve. I put them on a birth control pill to suppress their LH. I overlap the birth control pill with Lupron. And then after they have a period, which occurs five to seven days after the overlap, I then give the patient FSH, in the form of folistim or gonalef or puragon. And after the second day of folistim, I will lower the dosage and add a little bit of menopure so that I'm adding a little bit of HCG for its LH-like activity to produce some testosterone to feed to the follicle so the egg of the follicle can grow best. And then I watch the woman's follicles through daily ultrasounds and blood estradiol measurements and when they're adequately developed I give the woman 10,000 units of HCG. I don't use Ovidrol but 500 micrograms of Ovidrol is adequate and if you do that for the woman that's got reasonably normal ovarian reserve, in other words an AMH level of above 1 you will usually do well and you don't need very high doses of stimulation uh, with the uh, folistim and menopure to get to the desired result. Here's the long protocol again, but without using a birth control pill. Nothing wrong with doing this in normal responders. It is not good, in my opinion, to do this in women who have diminished ovarian reserve. But if you start on the 21st day of the cycle, usually about seven days after, um, um, sorry, 21 days after the cycle, which is usually about seven days after ovulation, you then start with the agonist Lupron and now just continue till the period comes. When the period comes, add the FSH and the menopure two or three days later. You, two days later, you drop the dose of the folistim and add FSH and menopure and you're back to the same situation and then trigger when the follicles are developed with HCG or 500 milligrams micrograms of Ovidrel. Here's another protocol, one that I use in all my patients with diminished ovarian reserve. Women who've definitely got AMHs of under 1.5 and usually under 1 nanogram per milliliter. It's very similar to the, it is a long protocol, but it's a modified long protocol. Again, the birth control pill to suppress LH and give the ovaries a breather. Overlap with Lupron for about two or three days. 10 units a day and then drop the dosage and then continue the dosage of 10 units up to the point of the menstrual cycle beginning. The woman will have a period. When that happens, we start her on folistim. But at that very point, not six days later, we give her ganrelix or cetratide, only the dosage is halved. So instead of using 250 micrograms of uh, of Ganrelix or Cetratide or Orgolutron, I would use 125 micrograms and add that uh, and switch to that uh, the moment you start the stimulation. On the third day, I drop the dose of FSH like before, add a little bit of Menopure and continue to the trigger with HCG. This is an antagonist protocol without a birth control pill. I don't like to use this protocol much.
but it's acceptable. It's better than using the antagonist in the, from the middle of the stimulation. So what I do here is when the period begins, I start them on the very first day with 125 units of Orgolutron Cetratide Ganrelix. Start the stimulation with FSH and after two or three days, drop the FSH and add 37.5 to 75 units of Menopure all the way to the day of the trigger. And it works quite well. This shows you the, what the microflare protocol is like which I don't use. Again, never do this protocol if you're on a birth control pill up to the period. In my opinion, that suppresses the FSH and makes it harder for the antral follicles to respond to stimulation. So what, I would, what this protocol involves, and again, if you're using this, it should only be for young women who have got normal ovarian reserve. And here you give the Lupron from the first day of the period, all the way through the stimulation, and then you stimulate with FSH and, and Menopure, or Menopure only, or FSH only, you go all the way through to the day of the HCG. Again, this is by far my least favorite protocol of use, and I don't ever use it. Here's a late antagonist protocol that is traditionally used, and what the pharmaceutical companies recommend. I respect their right to make that recommendation. I respectfully disagree. In my opinion, starting the antagonist so late does nothing to protect the egg in its development in the first five days from overexposure to LH-induced testosterone. But with this protocol, somewhere around the sixth to the eighth day of stimulation, that's when the antagonist gets added. And it does block the LH, but it does it so late that you haven't protected the egg in its most vulnerable stage of development, in my opinion. And then there's mini IVF, or what sometimes is called easy IVF. This is where clomiphene is used, or Fumara, to start the stimulation from day two to day five of the cycle. I don't do mini IVF because I see most people seem to think that if they have got diminished reserve or they're older, they'd be better off with a lower stimulation. That's an erroneous belief. That's like saying brushing your teeth for half the time you need to is probably more natural than brushing it all of the time, the full time period. As far as I'm concerned, giving clomiphene and Femara to a woman who's already at risk of increased LH-induced testosterone makes matters worse. If you're going to do this mini IVF, I would use mini doses, doses of stimulation all the way through, but I would not use clomiphene and Femara. Then again, even low dose of stimulation is a bad thing if you're not suppressing the LH while you're doing it. This is often used in combination with banking embryos in repeated cycles. There is a program in New York where this mini approach is used across the board. And they do a tremendous amount of IVF. But the pregnancy rates are under 10%. So I don't think that's why people go into IVF. The cost of IVF is not the cost of a procedure. It is the cost of having a baby. And I believe this diminishes your chances very significantly. And then there's natural cycle IVF. Here you use no drugs. You simply monitor the patient um, throughout by looking at the growth of her one or two follicles that develop and then trigger with HCG. What you're saving with natural cycle IVF is only the fact that you don't have to spend money on the fertility drugs. But the monitoring is the same and maybe even more intensive because you've got to watch very, very closely for the development of the natural follicle. It'll work, but again, it's best used in young women with normal ovarian reserve who are ovulating on their own. But it is not an ideal protocol for older women or women with diminished reserve because, again, you're doing nothing to suppress LH-induced excess testosterone. So what are the other considerations about stimulation? We get people that under-respond, and for them you'll see we use the estrogen priming approach I touched on. There is the addition of growth hormone, which some believe improves a follicle response to stimulation. I'm definitely unconvinced. 
but it's worth a try in some cases. And when all stimulations fail, when you reach the point of desperation, then of course egg donation. Or for older women over 43, diminished ovarian reserve well below 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. Or women over 43, egg donation is certainly an option and a pre preferable option, preferred option. Then there are those that over-respond with ovarian hyperstimulation and they're at risk of making too many follicles and becoming seriously ill. There are ways to respond to that, what some people do when there are too many follicles and the estrogen level is too high. They try to stop the stimulation early before the estrogen goes too high by triggering with HCG or Ovidrel and oftentimes using lower doses, which I told you is erroneous in my opinion. The problem with that approach is the follicles aren't developed adequately. The eggs haven't reached their full development and the number of eggs that you get will be reduced because eggs that are grossly abnormal and haven't fully developed remain stuck to the inside of the follicle and they don't come out when you put a needle in and suck them out, try to suck them out. Often this is referred to as an empty follicle syndrome, which is an erroneous state, uh, 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 label in my opinion because there is, in my opinion, no such thing as an empty follicle. Uh, you, it's a contradiction. In fact, you can't have a follicle without an egg that is conducting the orchestration of its growth. So when you get an empty follicle with no egg in it, it's usually because there was a technical problem in the procedure or the egg is so grossly aneuploid that it won't come free. It won't signal cells around it to release and disperse so that the egg can come out. And so you end up with empty follicles. That's very likely to occur if you trigger too early. You may rescue the woman from the risks of ovarian hyperstimulation, but you do nothing to enhance the quality or her chances of getting pregnant. The second method that's often used is to use a Lupron trigger. Lupron will cause, as I told you earlier, expunging of LH from the pituitary. So it does what happens in nature. You get an LH surge induced by the Lupron. You will reduce the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation in this way, but you can't predict how much LH is released. And there again, you will protect the woman, but you will have reduced yield of eggs, poorer quality eggs, and in my opinion, much poorer outcomes. The third way is to drop the dose of the HCG from 10,000 units to 5,000 or to go to Ovidrol 250 micrograms. I've already referred to that. That is a misinformed way of going because in the very patients who got so many follicles, you actually need more LH-like activity to send all the follicles, all the eggs into meiosis. And then there is another method, the one I prefer, which I described in 1989 first, known as prolonged coasting. Here what you do is you stimulate the woman and when you get to the point that you can see based upon the number of follicles she's got, usually over 25, and an estradiol level that reaches 2500 that she's headed and, that, and also that half her follicles are at least 14 millimeters in diameter, then we project that she's going to develop ovarian hyperstimulation and we then stop the stimulation but continue the Lupron avoiding any LH coming through and wait until the estradiol level will first go up and then come down. And when it comes to within a safe range, again, under 2,500 uh, million international units, 2,500 picograms per milliliter, that's when you trigger with 10,000 units of HCG. That's called coasting. And I'll show you an example in a moment. And then there are other considerations like a thin uterine lining, that can often be due to the type of protocol that you use that produces too much testosterone, getting too much into the, into the uterine blood supply. And if it's not that, then often the uterine lining is not responding because of poor blood flow to the uterine lining. And then you can use vaginal Viagra suppositories, which will improve the lining. And it will work in those cases. Sometimes the thin lining is because the lining has been damaged by surgery and overzealous DNC or infection after pregnancy such as endometritis that occurs after a retained product of conception or postpartum infection. And Viagra will not help that.
Then there's the other one, a consideration called premature luteinization. That's when you don't suppress the LH adequately by using the Lupron, as I've described, or down-regulating properly. And what happens is the LH starts to rise on its own, and when it rises, it increases the production of testosterone, and this stops the follicles from growing, and the follicles arrest, the estradiol level drops. This is often referred to as a premature LH surge, but it's not a premature LH surge. It's a staircase increase in LH, which becomes dangerous to the developing follicle. And when that happens, if the estradiol Dial level drops more than 20% in 24 hours, or if you end up with this kind of effect, the eggs are doomed. You're not going to get a pregnancy. And then there's the empty follicle syndrome that I've already mentioned earlier on. Under responders make few eggs. They have also often got poor embryo quality because protocols that are used are not strategically designed, not carefully evaluated, and not carefully implemented. And mistakes are often made in the process. The way to treat that, as we mentioned, human growth hormone is often used. DHEA is, in my opinion, the, exactly the wrong thing to use. Uh, estrogen priming, I'll show you an example of that, where we give estrogen before the stimulation begins to try to hype up the follicles and make their cells more responsive to FSH. And then the one that I like a lot is embryo banking when done in combination with estrogen priming. And embryo, embryo banking is simply collecting numerous blastocysts over numerous cycles with the right protocol to protect them from being overly likely to be aneuploid and then stockpiling them cycle after cycle till there are enough of them so that you can send away uh, the DNA biopsied from all the cells, from the cells of each embryo to find out which ones are normal and then in a later frozen embryo transfer get uh, transfer the embryos to the uterus. I will tell you that there's a lot of evidence to show, at the very least, that vitrification, which is a new safe freezing method we use that is very rapid, doesn't harm embryos much, and that the baby rate with frozen vitrified embryos is as good, if not better, in many such cases as it will be with fresh embryo transfers. So embryo banking only adds to this and we have many many patients who have babies whereas they ordinarily would not in the embryo banking process we do genetic testing of the embryos to make sure that which we're putting back is normal and then there's egg donation which is the best way to treat very poor responders who've got exceedingly low amh levels and ovarian reserve and all women over 43 should preferentially in my opinion consider using egg donation so who will benefit from this advanced um, agonist-antagonist conversion protocol with estrogen priming? What I call an LA10 E2V. This is a, an older woman, woman over 41, who have diminished ovarian reserve and any very young woman or any young woman who's got very diminished ovarian reserve. We spoke about the triggering. Um, you, we trigger women when at least two follicles are over 18 but less than 22 millimeters, provided that half of the remaining follicles are over 15 millimeters. And the lining is at least, it shouldn't say nine, it should say eight millimeters with a trilaminar appearance at the time of the trigger. So what do we do with those women that are high responders very quickly? As I pointed out, if you stimulate them incorrectly, if you trigger them too early, if you use too low a dosage of HCG, if you use Lupron triggers, you're much more likely to end up with poor quality eggs, less good quality eggs, less mature eggs, and less eggs altogether due to the follicles not yielding any eggs, what people erroneously call empty follicles, and what really means the eggs remain stuck in the follicle and never came out. This is preventable by using, an, in my opinion, an optimal protocol of stimulation. And then there's the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So who's at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation? These are women who have PCOS, women who don't ovulate or menstruate, women that thus have dysfunctional or absent ovul uh, ovulation, women who menstruate irregularly, 
Women who have a very high ovarian reserve with an AMH that is well over 2, usually above 4, and a very low FSH, and exceedingly young women. Women under the age of 25 are ones that are also very likely to develop ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And it's for that reason that I don't like using women under the age of 25 as egg donors because they respond erratically. We get poorer quality eggs because of the concern that they'll hyperstimulate and the actions that are often taken to avoid that from happening. So when we reduce the risk of severe ovarian hyperstimulation, there are ways to do this, as I mentioned. Triggering earlier with HCG is wrong. Using a lower dose of HCG doesn't solve the problem. Triggering with an agonist Lupron, in my opinion, adds to the problem. And freezing all the embryos is a solution. If you get a woman that has got a lot of follicles and you're fearful that she may hyperstimulate, you can vitrify all her embryos without prejudice and put them back later and give her the same chance of pregnancy because ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is life endangering, is, is a rate limiting, is a, is a time limited uh, occurrence. If the woman doesn't get pregnant, it'll be gone within two weeks of its starting and you, it's always self-limiting. It's women who get pregnant and add their own HCG of the pregnancy to the equation that increases the risk to these women. And then there's prolonged coasting, which I'll share with you right now. Here's a typical way we do prolonged coasting. The woman starts off on the birth control pill. I never showed you that. Uh, she's on the agonist and she's on the FSH after going through a long protocol of down regulation. And then when we see her with more than 25 follicles, more than 50% of which are over 15 milli 14 millimeters, and her estradiol is over 2,500, all three must be present at that point. Then we stop the FSH and continue giving the Lupron all the way until the FSH level drops again below 2,500. We stop the coast and trigger with HCG. Bear in mind, I'm showing you part of the stimulation. Prior to this point here, prior to here, the woman's been on a birth control pill overlapped with a Lupron to bring her into this phase of the cycle. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the poor uterine lining. There are many ways people try to treat that. I've told you already if it's a damaged endometrium from scarring or from infection, vaginal Viagra won't work. If the woman's got a poor lining due to PCOS, vaginal Viagra won't work because it desensitizes the endometrium to estrogen, and Viagra won't counter that. But if you've got a lining that's thin, as most are, due to deficient blood supply, then vaginal Viagra plus aspirin will work. Adding more estrogen also doesn't really help much. Here's a lining that is very, very thin. You can see it's only 5 millimeters. Here's that same lining after Viagra. You can see the woman having a nice thick trilaminar appearance with an 11 millimeter lining. Thank you very much for your attention. I will now be willing to take any questions that you might have. I hope it wasn't too complex and uh, that this was helpful to you. All right, let's go. Thank you, Tom. So we get to the first question. Uh, we'll start at the bottom with the first question. What protocol would you recommend for diminished ovarian reserve? I've been cancelled three times. I would recommend a robust agonist-antagonist conversion protocol. And if it's very severe reserve, a diminished reserve, adding estrogen priming combined with embryo banking and staggered IVF where the embryos are banked until there are enough of them that are normal to allow us to put them back as FETs and possibly adding human growth hormone to the equation. Shannon writes, do you have available in your, do you have available in your IVF schedule in July? No, Shannon, our July cycle is totally full, but we have a cycle on the 22nd of August, which has still got some open spots. I do 10 batches a year, so my patients always know exactly when they arrive, exactly when they leave. If you want more information, call 1-800-780-7437, or if you're out of country, one 702 
699-7437. Ask for Tina McKittrick and ask her to put your name down for a Skype consultation to discuss your case and maybe we can get something done. Daniela writes, what protocol for eggs to be healthy, blastocysts and make it a transfer? Daniela, as I've pointed out, your age is the most important factor. And then comes the way in which your ovaries are stimulated. So the protocol will depend upon your individual profile, which would need to be evaluated through a consultation and a discussion and review of all of the parameters. Those tests that have not been done will be done. Those done already will not be repeated to find this out. Annette writes, I had two day six blastocysts that were frozen and eventually transferred to me. They said the embryo was good, but it never implanted. What could prevent a good blastocyst? Firstly, Annette, looking good doesn't mean it's chromosomally and genetically normal. But let's assume you mean that it was tested and it is normal. There's also two other factors that you can't account for simply by the embryo being good. The one is the skill of the doctor putting the embryo back and the technical aspects of embryo transfer should never be underrated. In any given batch of doctors, some do much better transfers than others. Most do good transfers, but some are better than others. And the second thing is, other than that, uh, the, um, the skill of the doctor, there's also whether or not there happens to be an implantation problem. I've given this talk over and over and said that it's not just the quality of the embryo that determines success. Everybody seems to think it's just get a good embryo into the uterus and that will give you a better success rate. It will if your uterus is receptive. But there are anatomical and immunologic factors that can prevent implantation. Certain women who've got immunologic issues that are linked to endometriosis, a family or personal history of hypothyroidism, lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, may have immunologic issues. Also, women with unexplained IVF failure, women with recurrent pregnancy loss. Such women need to be evaluated thoroughly, properly for immunologic factors. If you then fix those factors and you expertly put good quality embryos into the uterus, you should optimize your success rate. Um, Melanie says, is there anything that should be done differently during a frozen cycle on a patient that, has, that is diabetic? Not really, except that whenever you stimulate someone, whenever you stress someone that is diabetic, you make it more brittle. So you need to have your diabetes well under control. Uh, then, uh, then there is, uh, the next one is Janine, who writes, what causes an egg to have more than one polar body? Well, I think you've just got the answer from me earlier on. If the egg was immature uh, and, that I and, and that egg fertilizes and for some reason uh, you end up with an extra polar body coming from the sperm or if more than one sperm fertilize the egg, then you can end up with a, with a polyploid embryo. Um, Janine, what was Janine writes? Uh, Catherine writes, prior to fertilization, what should you look for to evaluate whether you retrieved eggs of good quality? Firstly, are they nice and round? Secondly, is there no granulation or darkness of the inner part of the egg? Thirdly, can you see that there's a polar body visible? Because that polar body means it went through meiosis, and that's very important. It's an absolute prerequisite. An egg that has not gone through meiosis will not make an embryo that can make a baby. And then, finally, you can do genetic testing on the fertilized egg or embryo uh, to see if it's got all of its chromosomes. Um, and then Annette writes again, can acupuncture increase egg quality? No, I'm afraid not, Annette, but it can help with the uterine lining in some cases, in my opinion. Angie says, can someone who has been diagnosed with PCS do this? Yes, of course. Can, Justin says, can higher dosages of stimulations in diminished ovarian reserve patient result in poor egg quality? No. 
if you've got severely diminished ovarian reserve, what you what does not attach to the receptors on the follicle cells will spill out of your body and be lost. Anybody who tells you that a high dosage in a woman with diminished ovarian reserve can damage the eggs is wrong. It can damage the eggs if you use it in a woman with high ovarian reserve. If you overstimulate it, then all those problems I mentioned earlier on fall into line. Let me just take a sip here, if I may. Excuse me. Laurie writes, does, does AMH affect egg quality the same way as the woman's age? No. The AMH is a measure of how many eggs are present. And because the poor, the lower the number of eggs present, the more likely there is to be activation and overgrowth of the theca and stroma and too much testosterone, that can produce a bad egg, especially if you don't implement an ideal protocol of stimulation. When you say at 40, one in six eggs are euploid, does that mean include all eggs at the retrieval or just mature eggs? All eggs at retrieval, if the stimulation is done correctly. Annette then writes, you said two is not a good number for AMH. What is an ideal number for AMH? I said that two or more is ideal. 1.5 to 2 is acceptable. Under 1.5 is bad. Over 4.5 is suggestive that the woman may be at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. Uh, Shannon says, can many rounds of stimulation cause the AMH to drop? No, Shannon, it cannot. Shannon also writes, does taking DHEA cause too much testosterone? It can be cause too much testosterone in women who have diminished ovarian reserve and are older and in older women, in my opinion. When I did the IVF cycles in New York, they had me take Menopure and Letrozole, even though at the time I was 43. Um, I can't I'm not prepared to point a finger at any particular doctor doing this. I can only tell you this, Annette, that would not be my preferred approach. Christina says, is Lupron Depot used for endometriosis considered a flare protocol? If you start the injection at the time of the stimulation, it is. Because its initial effect will be to expunge all the LH out of the pituitary. And you don't want that to happen as the eggs are leaving the starting gates of stimulation. But if you started the depot Lupron weeks beforehand, then no, it is not a flare approach. Jocelyn says, with undetectable AMH at 34, FSH at 12, my protocol is microdose flare with Menopure. All I can say to you, Jocelyn, is that in my opinion, that is not the way I would go about doing it for all the reasons I gave you. Again, your doctor may have specific reasons why he's using this approach and may believe in it. And I'm not willing to point fingers, but that is not what I would do. Laurie writes, with an FSH of, of 17 and an AMH of 0 0.1, is there any point to doing IVF? I would say, Laurie, the chances of success are extremely low. It depends on your age. If you're still young, you may want to try uh, an agonist-antagonist conversion protocol with estrogen priming and human growth hormone. That's called a, a uh, LA10, LA10E2V protocol to see what happens once. If it doesn't work, then you know you need an egg donor. But my bet is it probably won't work. Katie writes that at 36, she has... Um, High FSH and low AMH. She's doing IVF with embryo banking and batching. CCS testing with Fragile X. I've had five cycles and keep getting dominant follicles. Uh, that's, in, that's not good, by the way, Katie. Uh, in two cycles, it was ignored and I did get to retrieval. Katie, I do believe that the occurrence of dominant follicles also has to do with the stimulation protocol. I think what they're doing at uh, CC, CSS, uh, what they're doing at your clinic um, with CSS testing is fine. Fragile X testing is fine. The concept of banking is good, but unless the protocol used to stimulation, which was my opening statement, 
in this uh, presentation is optimal, individualized, and suited to your needs. And by the way, that's not always easy to do. You are not going to get good eggs and you'll get dominant follicles and you're not going to be successful. The two successful cycles, says Kate, that she had resulted in a, to in, in a total in day three five of uh, five embryo five embryos in day three if i'm producing eggs and follicles despite fxpoy isn't it just finding the, the right ivf protocol it is absolutely finding the right protocol in my opinion kate shannon writes last ivf cycle i started with birth control pills then lupron and letrozole then breval and menopure i never got my period but continued the cycle first again i'm offering my opinion I'm not criticizing others. I'm telling you what my opinion is here. And I want to be clear on this point. There may be other medical reasons why you, what d was done what was done. But I do not believe it's a good idea to start stimulation unless there's a bleed or the endometrial lining at the start of stimulation is well under 5 millimeters. I also uh, want to be sure that if you did the birth control pill and then Lupron, you didn't use the birth control pill all the way up to the stimulation and then start Lupron. Because in my opinion, that is not ideal. And that's my own opinion. I don't know the details of your situation. At this point, again, let me just say, for those of you who are interested in learning more or talking to me about your particular case, because I'm extremely busy, I ask you to call as soon as possible to 1-800-780-7437 or, if you're out of country, 702-699-7437 and have Tina McKittrick set you up with a consultation. If you just want my input, you can actually go to my, my blog at ivfauthority.com www.ivfauthority.com and go to the, to the question and answer board, post your questions there, and I go there several times a day, so I will answer your questions as they arise. Have you ever used cetratide half-dose all over the stimulation without using oral contraceptive pills in the previous cycle. Yes, I indicated earlier on that there is a cycle, and you can go back to looking at this again on the, um, 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 where are we putting it? The on the archive, in the archives, and you can pick it up tomorrow, it'll be posted, and look again at what that protocol looks like. There's no birth control pill, and then you start on the first day of stimulation, of the first day of the period, and on the day of stimulation with 125 micrograms of cetratide, which is half dose, and you continue it all the way through. I don't prefer that approach. I much prefer the birth control pill launch. Uh, Kylie Marie writes, is it possible to get more follicles after the baseline? Or what you see is what you get? It depends how good you are at looking at the antral follicle count, which is often not that accurate. But usually you will not be able to get more follicles than the total number of antral follicles that are there. Catherine writes, with the AACP, what dosage do you recommend for the Lupron? I start with 10 units of Lupron, and when the period uh, comes and we switch to the stimulation, I stop the Lupron immediately, go straight to 125 micrograms of Ganarelix or Cetratide or Orgolutron, and at that, on that s same day, start with the stimulation with FSH-dominant stimulation such as Puragon, Folistim, or gone left. Catherine writes, what role does tamoxifen play in the IVF process? Tamoxifen is a, is a relative of clomiphene, and all the things that I said for clomiphene apply to tamoxifen as well. Why do 80% of my eggs come out immature when my hormone levels denote maturity? Um, again, it could have to do with the protocol used for stimulation. It could have to do with how you were triggered in other words, did you use too low a dose of uh, HCG, such as 5,000 units of HCG or 250 micrograms of uh, Ovidrel, or did you use a Lupron trigger? You say you use 10,000 units plus 2 milligrams of Lupron. I frankly don't know the reason for the Lupron. I don't think there's a need for a Lupron 
plus HCG trigger. But I would need to look at your protocol very carefully, Katie. And I urge you to maybe call the 800 number, 780-7437. Set up a time so we can go through your case and see. There's got to be a reason. And that reason is almost always, not always, but almost always addressable. Sarah says, has there been any studies on the use of IVF with women who are exposed to DES? Does that exposure change the ability to use hormones in these women? No, the DES does not affect the ovaries. The DES affects the uterus and the lining. And that's a whole different subject for discussion. But when it comes to the ovaries, the DES will have no effect on the ovaries. Uh, sorry, Carthiga. You say you have bilateral tubal blockage with tubercular salpingitis. Uh, your TB um, uh, PCR was negative in the uterus. Two fresh and one failed uh, cycle, and you got uh, two fresh and one frozen cycle. They failed, and you got good embryos. It's important in women who've got tuberculosis to absolutely exclude tuberculous endometritis or damage to the inside of the uterus, because if that is the problem, you're not going to get pregnant in your uterus and you will need to use a surrogate, in my opinion. But if you test negative by PCR, you make a good lining and the hysteroscopy of the uterus is normal and the biopsy shows no evidence of uh, tuberculous endometritis, then you could still be get pregnant with your own eggs if the other factors we mentioned have been addressed. Daniela writes, why I had... Why I... Why were five out of ten eggs fractured? That's a trauma. That usually happens uh, with the egg retrieval. Uh, it's only preventable if you lower the pressure with which you extract the egg. Because if you suck too hard, the eggs can hit this, the, the, the bevel of the needle and can be fractured. It's not the only reason. It can happen de novo without explanation. But the one preventable factor is to keep the pressure, the negative pressure with which you suck the eggs out, low. Will major surgery with several post-surgical meds uh, 90 days ago impact egg quality today? No. Shannon says, is an AMH of 1.5 at 32 abnormal? It is on the low side. It means you've got to be proactive. You don't want to wait to see the levels go down, but it's not critically low. It's still perfectly acceptable. And be quite honest with you, sometimes you get a surprise. Even with a low AMH, the woman will respond better, which is why I mentioned earlier on to the lady with a very low AMH, not to throw in the towel without at least having one test run to see whether she's one of those who will respond better than the AMH alone would suggest. What would be the best protocol for DOR and adenomyosis? The adenomyosis is by, the, is by the way, it's happenstance. It's got nothing to do with egg quality. That affects the uterus. That's where the lining of the uterus grows into the wall of the uterus like a sponge, reducing blood flow to the lining. But it does nothing to do with DOR. The DOR is treated in the way I, I described. Uh, Catherine writes, is Lupron four days after birth control pills? Uh, and one day before Menopure, Gonal F, count as a flare protocol. Um, if you started after the birth control pill and one day before Menopure, I still think that's too soon, in my opinion. It's not a typical flare protocol, but it's a kind of a hybrid. Annette writes, thank you, Annette, it's my great pleasure. I really enjoy doing these because I know that many people out there who've got these problems can't find answers to some of these basic questions. And I, I like to be able to try to narrow it down to a simple explanation because if you understand what is happening, then you understand what shouldn't happen during the stimulation and you can have more control of your own situation. So I really do thank you for that kind comment. Padilla writes, I was taking 0.2 Lupron uh, 450 units of gonolef and 75 units of menopause. I'm 35. Uh, at retrieval, I had one dominant empty follicle. Sounds to me like you had a flare protocol, Padilla. And I rest my case. Catherine writes, I started Lupron four days after the birth control pill and then started gonolef. I think we answered that question already. Kerry says, what does it mean if there's a fragmented zona pellucida? That means that the zona, the egg is fractured. I answered that question it can happen de novo without explanation. 
But the one thing that sometimes does that is if there is too high a negative pressure when you suck the eggs out. Um, Katie and Sarah, thank you for your kind words. Again, my great pleasure. Shannon says, why did out of 11 mature eggs, only six fertilize with ICSI? That depends on a lot of factors. It could be normal. It's not too bad. It depends on what the quality of those eggs were. Kathiga writes, is there any specific test to find if my uterus is affected with, my inf with infection? Since I had tuberculosis in the past, they can do biopsy, a, a DNC biopsy and PCR of the endometrium and tell you. And also look at it under path uh, pathologically. Catherine, thank you for your kind words. God bless you. Daniela, it's my pleasure. Uh, Shannon writes, thank you also. And thank you, Shannon. This was a big seminar, I, a big webinar. And it, it really, uh, I think, was an important one. Of all those I've done, there is nothing that's more important than selecting the protocol. And you can't do it by a recipe. One size fits all doesn't work. And you end up finding problems uh, in the end uh, because you created the wrong environment in the ovary. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Please feel free to call and go to the blog and call Shannon, uh, call Christina, uh, not Christina, Tina, uh, for a consultation if you want to talk. Good night and God bless.